So, uh, okay, so I'd like to uh, thank our chapter president, Yang Liu, for introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Hao Wu, for me, and also thank Dr. Hao Wu to accept the invitation twice, you know, once for the physical meeting and once for the online meeting. Um, so Dr. Hao Wu is currently the uh, ASA and uh, Patricia Springer <coughs> Professor of Biochemistry and Molecular Pharmacology at the Harvard Medical School. Uh, she also serves as the Associate Director of the program in Cellular and Molecular Medicine at the Boston Children's Hospital. So Dr. Hao Wu did her undergraduate in Peking University, uh, major in biology, uh, same as me, so she's a shijie for me. Uh, she then did her MD candidacy training <coughs> in uh, Xiehe, the uh, uh, Peking Uni Medical College, uh, before going to Purdue University uh, to get her PhD uh, in biochemistry. Uh, she did her postdoc training at the Columbia University and uh, started her own lab at Cornell University in 1997 as an assistant professor and quickly rise to associate professor and full professor in Cornell. So in 2012, she moved her lab to Harvard Medical School and bought Boston Children's. So Dr. Hao received many major awards. Uh, to name a few, uh, uh, she's, uh, uh, she received the Rita Allen Sch Sch Scholar Award several times. <laughs> and the Margaret uh, Dayhoff Memorial Award, uh, an American uh, Crystal Graphic Association Award, uh, also the NIH Merit Award and the NIH Pioneer Award. Uh, she was elected as a fellow for the AAAS in 2013, and then uh, sh she was elected to the National Academy of Science in 2015. The very high honor as a scientist. So uh, Hall served as uh, in, on the editor board of Cancer Cell uh, since 2012. Uh, she published uh, many publications, over 160. Uh, many of them uh, uh, on top journal like Cell, Nature, and Science. So Dr. Hall Wu has made many seminal contributions in the field of structure immunology and particularly in the structural basis of intracellular signal transduction uh, in the mammalian innate immune system. Uh, among her many uh, major contribution to science, uh, uh, and name a few, you know, include elucidation of the molecular basis of TNF-induced necrosis, discovery of principle of higher order assemblies and their important properties in signaling transduction and also mechanism of uh, inflammation assembly and regulation, which uh, I guess she will talk about today. Uh, she's also uh, working on novel signal transduction complexes as a new targets for drug discovery. So without further ado, I present Dr. Hao Wu as a, a keynote speaker today. Uh, the title of her talk is uh, Inflammation uh, in Health and Disease. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe, for the very kind introduction. Uh, indeed, I would also like to thank uh, Yang for inviting me uh, to this uh, wonderful symposium. So my current title uh, is Making Pores for Cytokine Secretion. Uh, what I would like to talk about is uh, <laughs> focus on the mechanism uh, for the secretion of L1 family of cytokines downstream of inflammasome activation and take you through some of the evolution in our understanding on this subject, subject in the past few years. So for those who are outside the field, inflammasomes are supermolecular complexes that activate caspase-1 in response to many different danger signals, such as bacterial toxins, bacterial effector proteins, viral DNA, and other insults that cause the so-called potassium efflux, including extracellular aggregates, such as uric acid crystals, cholesterol crystals, and even amyloids. So there are two main aspects of 
downstream functions of inflammasomes. One is the maturation of the interleukin-1 family of cytokines, and the other is the induction of a highly inflammatory form of cell death known as pyroptosis. Because the inflammasomes are activated by a wide range of stimuli, they have been associated with numerous human diseases and have become a highly sought after target in therapeutics shown by some of the high profile billion dollar acquisitions of startups in recent years. In an inflammasome centric view, if you will, almost all diseases of, uh, of all the different organs may have an inflammatory component. However, mechanisms of the inflammasome biology remain to be addressed in many different aspects, even after the many transformations the field has gone through in history, starting from a curiosity on the understanding of fever. So in 1851, Zimmerman suggested that fever might be caused by products of inflammatory lesions. And then a hundred years after, uh, it was uh, discovered that fever may be produced by proteins because this activity is heat labile. And then several decades after, the activity itself, interleukin-1 that is, was named uh, based on uh, the fact that this activity is causing leukocyte activation between leukocytes. And then a few years after, finally, the interleukin-1 alpha and interleukin-1 beta, which are founding members of the interleukin-1 family, was cloned, as shown here. And it is known that interleukin-1, at least the beta, need to be processed to release the mature interleukin-1. And the enzyme that's responsible for this was cloned in 1992 as the first member of the caspase family which was also cloned as ICE into looking one converting enzyme. And another 10 years has elapsed before the first inflammasome was identified and isolated to show that it recruit and activate caspase one. However, the question of how do these R1 family cytokines get released remain unknown. And the reason is that these family members, unlike other cytokines such as TNF, it does not have a signal sequence. So it cannot be released through the ER secretory pathway. So some, some mechanism has to, uh, has to uh, 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 take care of this release of the cytokines even after it's being processed. And because this mechanism was unknown, uh, it was named unconventional protein secretion uh, to, uh, to show that this is a, a mechanism that um, still remain to be discovered. The answer to this question was really dramatically improved in 2015 when Feng Xiao, another uh, uh, Chinese colleague and Bishwar Dixit's lab both identified gastermin D as the downstream effector of caspase one and other related inflammatory caspases. Basically, this gastermin D protein is a bona fide substrate of all the inflammatory caspases. And upon cleavage, the N-terminal domain somehow gets to the cell membrane to damage the membrane. And the consequence is that this damage can allow interleukin-1 to get released and also to induce pyroptotic cell death. So then because pyroptosis is a highly lytic form of cell death, as shown here, you see these bubbles that, um, that are generated during pyroptosis showing the lysis of the cell, then the Hypothesis becomes that the L1 and other cytokines are perhaps related by pyroptosis. So the cell has to die in order for these cytokines to get released. Is that true? 
So when Feng Shao's lab published his studies on gas germing D and its role in membrane damage, I was very excited for many reasons, one of which is that all forms of cell death appears to involve membrane damage for apoptosis, the BCL2 family proteins needs to damage the mitochondria, and for necroptosis, the MLKL family of proteins need to damage the cytoplasmic membrane. But the mechanism all of all these membrane damage remain unclear. So teaming up with my colleague, Judy Lieberman, we decided to address this question on the mechanism of gastermine D membrane damage. So Judy's lab looked at how the gastermine D N terminus, when expressed uh, ectopically, can induce membrane damage. They show that the gastermine D N terminus can oligomerize and can cause this damage uh, as shown here by immunofluorescence. And when we reconstituted gastermin D N terminus in vitro using a liposome technology, we show that these uh, gastermin D N terminal protein form a well-defined pores. This is quite different from how BCL2 family of proteins or how MLKL family of proteins work. Gastermin D actually formed nice pores that have a inner diameter that is large enough for interleukin one to pass. So then the hypothesis becomes uh, perhaps these pores itself can be responsible for the release of these cytokines. In order to form these pores, the gastrimin D N terminus has to interact with acidic lipids. So in this lipid binding strip assay, you see that full lens gas germing does not have any affinity for any lipids, nor the C-terminal fragment, but the N-terminal fragment can interact with PIPs, also with phosphatidic acid and phosphatidylserine, PS. And all these lipids, as you may know, resides on the inner leaflet of a mammalian cell membrane suggesting that gastrimin D has to kill from inside a cell. Gastrimin D and terminus also interact with cardiolipine, shown here. And because cardiolipine is a component of the bacterial membrane and the mitochondrial membrane, we hypothesized and uh, show that gastrimin D can also kill both intracellular and extracellular bacteria. And, and of course, it should also be able to kill mitochondria, which uh, we showed um, uh, since. So we wanted to know how the gastrimin D N terminus form these pores and what is the structural architecture of these pores. But the gastrimin D itself seems to be much more difficult to work with. As a structural project, we went to other members of the gastrimin family and fortunately, this gastermine family, which was initially just named for its expression in the dermis, dermin, and the, gastro, and the gastrointestinal tract, that's why gastermin, this family of proteins all can form pores when the NT is expressed. They all form the same similar kind of pores, but the activation mechanism for other members of the family remained unknown for quite some time uh, until more recently, several other enzymes are shown to activate gastrimin B and as well as gastrimin E. So the best protein we found was that the mouse gastrimin A3, a homolog of the human gastrimin A, give us the best kind of pores when we performed in vitro reconstitution. So classically, the, uh, the, the way to solve a structure of a pore is to do it on the liposome as shown here. So you can image these things on the electron microscope and then you block out these particles and then analyze them uh, in silico to deduce a structure. But, what we thought, but we thought that maybe uh, we should try a different way because this 
uh, this way of solving the structure is very time consuming. We thought we should solubilize the pores from the liposome in order to get a lot of pores so we can average them to get to a high resolution. And this is exactly what we did. Uh, first reconstitute the pores on the liposome. And then my postdoc and student went through an exhaustive list of different detergent. And finally they found that collate was able to solubilize these pores. And we then were able to solve the cryo-EM structure of the gastrimine A3 pore. Surprisingly, however, this first structure that we solved of this gastrimine A3 pore has two layers. Only one layer, which is the cyan layer, insert into the membrane shown by this beta barrel that you may be able to see when it rotates to the side. You see that's the beta barrel. And the orange ring does not have a beta barrel that's inserted into the ring. So it needs to be a soluble ring. So it's a stack of two rings. And perhaps because the stacking that causes some level of heterogeneity, we couldn't reach a higher resolution than 4.6 Armstrong. And then serendipitously, we found a way to separate out the two rings and the single rings now was able to reach a higher resolution from which we can deduce the individual subunit structure. So the structure itself for gastrimine A3 is composed of 27 subunits and each subunit contribute to four different beta strands so that the entire beta barrel contains 108 beta strands. It's one of the largest beta barrels that has been solved. So it turned out we were able to, to, to kill two birds with one stone, if you will, because one structure contains two confirmation of the pore. The orange pore turned out to be a precursor of the pore. That is, the uh, pore first need to be assembled onto the surface of the membrane, and then this gets inserted into the membrane to form the pore that can conduct uh, ions as well as small proteins such as um, interleukin-1. And the subunit structure is quite interesting and it's very easy to remember because the architecture resembles the left hand. Um, you can see these are the fingers, the four fingers of the hand that insert into the membrane and this is the palm region that's mediating the oligomerization outside the membrane. And then you have this alpha helix that represents the thumb region that's, as I will show you in the next slide, responsible for lipid interaction. And it situates right at the borderline between the lipid and the cytosolic region. So this is the residual lipid that we could see in the cryo-EM density. So remember, we had to solubilize the pores using detergent. Nonetheless, the lipid cardiolipin that we used in the reconstitution stayed associated with the pore and the head group of the, of the cardiolipin uh, is visible in the cryo-EM density and they form these ionic interactions with the highly positively charged thumb helix. If we compare the conformation of the interminal region before and after insertion, so this structure here was solved by Feng Shao's lab uh, as a autoinhibited structure. This is a C-terminal fragment, that's the interminal fragment. We can overlay the interminal fragment and show that the palm region really didn't change very much. It's really just the fingers that does the insertion into the membrane bilayer. And this insertion probably represent a complete refolding of the protein in the presence of the lipid. And uh, you can see this uh, uh, straightening of these fairly disordered regions into beta strands, as well as dragging other regions of the protein into the beta strand. It's quite an energetically downhill uh, process. So then this comes to the conclusion that we made, that is, uh, this is uh, a process of gastrimine D pore formation that requires a cut by the enzyme at the interdomain linker, caspase 
uh, one or cat space 11. And then this thing would interact with lipid and form a prepore. And then the prepore would insert into the membrane to form the pore as if it's a cookie cutter that tried to cut out a piece of dough as uh, also shown in this movie here. Oh, like that. So now uh, with the structure and with a study that we performed with John Kagan's lab on live cell secretion of interleukin-1 beta in which the cells do not need to die to release R1 as shown by the lack of release of this protein here, lactate dehydrogenase, which is large and cannot pass through the pore so that it can only be released if the cell have a ruptured cell membrane and, I, and are undergoing paraptotic cell death. So this then made us to think that this R1, um, the secretion of uh, R1 and other related cytokines are mediated by some kind of a size selection of the gastrin D pore. That is only smaller proteins can get out and larger proteins such as lactate dehydrogenase can, cannot get out. The reason that a cell can withstand some of these gastrin D pores on the, cell, on the cell surface may be because there's a repair mechanism that gets activated upon gastrin D pore insertion. And this is, this is because the pore would induce a calcium influx. And I won't show you, but um, in the structure that we solved uh, for gastrin D, which I will show you, but I will not show you this aspect of it. Uh, in fact, also um, cause membrane curvature and this curvature is poised for this repair mechanism to work and involving the s 3 system. So it is uh, a constant insertion and repair that's keeping the cell alive. At least that's uh, one way to rationalize the process. So my postdoc uh, took a job recently, but my student continued to work on the gastrin D itself because we still want to know exactly how this particular pore, which is the most biological, biologically relevant pore works. So he was able to use protein engineering to obtain fairly nice looking pores as shown here. And in these preparations, we also see double double layers. And this double layer is even more variable. Uh, the two layers is able to stack either this way and also to the back. And, and even um, the pore itself can stack or the pre-pore itself can stack. Nonetheless, we were able to isolate down the layer that we're looking for, either the pre-pore or the pore, and solve their structure individually. So this is a structure of the gastrin D pore. It looks really very similar, except that it is somewhat bigger. It contains 33 subunits rather than 27 subunit. I should say that all of these, uh, all of these pores has a size distribution. So for the gastrin D pore, 33 is, uh, 33 is, is the most prevalent pore size, but we also see pore size between 31 to 35. And same is for gastrin A3. We also see 27 and 28 in addition to, we also see 26 and 28 in addition to 27. So the pre-pore, if you overlay the pre-pore structure with the pore structure, you see that not only, not only the, uh, the, uh, the pre-pore does not have the transmembrane region as shown here, the head region, the palm region that is, the palm region also undergoes a conformational change during the membrane insertion. Basically the entire ray uh, raises over to the membrane as it inserts into the membrane. So as we continue to think about how L1 gets released from these pores, we realize that size selection may not be sufficient because if we look at 
whether pro-IL-1 gets released in cells without cell death, you see that pro really does not get released very much uh, to the supernatant, whereas the mature IL-1 gets released no problem. So this raises the question, can we use the structure to explain this? So when we look at the gastrin D structure that we solved, we realized that the pore itself is highly negatively charged, have a lot of negative charge as shown here. And pro IL-1, the pro domain itself also has a lot of acidic residues. So that if we do a electrostatic surface model for the pro cytokines, you see they're really, really red. And only when you remove the pro peptide into leukine one and into also into leukine one, uh, into leukine 18, which is a member of the into leukine one family, then do not show this uh, very prominent negative charge. So we thought perhaps there is a selectivity by charge. Although if you look at the electrostatic distribution around the pore and in the conduit, the amount of charge in there is very, very low. So what we did first was to look at this release of pro L1 versus release of mature L1 from in vitro, from an in vitro system that is using a liposome. So we encapsulated, we encapsulated purified interleukin-1, also interleukin-18 and pro-interleukin-1 and pro-interleukin-18 uh, into the liposome. So we make a liposome uh, with these proteins in the, in the solution so that they get encapsulated. And then we wash everything away so that the cytokine only exists inside the liposome. Then you add gastermine and to activate it. And if interleukin-1 can get released, but not pro-interleukin-1, we could see it. And indeed, this is what we see with the wild-type gastermine D. Mature cytokine can get released very easily, whereas the uh, the uh, the pro L1 cannot be released or released much less efficiently. But if we make mutations on the acidic patch on gastermine, we call it acidic patch one and acidic patch two. We tried patch one, two, three, four, but, but three and four didn't give viable protein. So we tested only AP1, AP2. Uh, you can see then when you reconstitute this liposome system with a AP1 mutation, the pro L1 gets released much more readily as shown here. And there's no change in how the mature L1 gets released. And for L18, this effect, it, is even more drastic. As you can see for the wild type, you barely see any pro-L1, pro-L18 come out. And with the AP1 mutant, you see the release of the pro-cytokine as well. And this can then further be re re recapitulated in cells. We used immortalized bone marrow derived macrophages that are either deficient in gastrimine D or deficient in interleukin-1 beta. So this way we can reconstitute the cells with wild type or the acidic patch mutant of gastrimine D. And also at the same time, we can use our one beta deficient cells to reconstitute uh, our one proteins that, are, uh, that have some of the acidic residues mutated out at their leader sequence. So as you can see here, wild type do not show any release of the pro cytokine. And when you remove some of the acidic charges on gas germin, suddenly pro L1 can also come out. And similarly, you mutate the acidic residues in R1 beta, you now also start to see the release of this uh, mutated uh, pro interleukin-1. So these um, uh, 
together suggest that there must be there must be both size and charge selection so that even though in the cells you have both material cytokine and procytokine, what you release are mainly material cytokine. And this way you can, you can, you can save the procytokines until they're cleaved uh, and to induce a uh, continuous or sustained interleukin-1 secretion. And this may be very, very important in some situations that's called hyperactivation, and that's uh, um, a process that's related to many interleukin-1 driven diseases. So similarly, and interestingly, it looks like not only gastermin D poor, but also other gastermins, including the A3 structure that we solved previously, all have a preferential negatively negative charge, suggesting that they all probably have some preference in releasing positively charged molecules and deter negatively charged molecules. And by association, I'm not saying this is causal, but by association, it looks like many damp molecules such as HMGB1 and cytochrome C, and they're all positively charged and may get released readily by the gastamine depot. So in the last uh, section, I'd like to show you our effort in trying to screen for gastamine D inhibitors. So you know that gastamine D is at this bottleneck of the inflammasome pathways. Doesn't matter which inflammasome is activated, by the time you get to the point of inducing cytokine release or cell death, you need this gastamine D protein. Without it, you will stop very effectively all the inflammatory response. So my, uh, my postdoc and a postdoc from Judy Lieberman's lab collaborated to look for gastamine D inhibitors. So with the screening of the known chemical, uh, known drug library, that's only about 3,000 or so uh, compounds, we found that disulfiram, which is a drug that's known for about 70 years, also known as antibuse, uh, is the most effective compound that can inhibit the liposome leakage. Remember, gastrimine insert into the liposome so that you cause a leakage in that membrane, and that's what we use to uh, screen for the inhibitors. It's very effective in inhibiting liposome leakage. And even after we screened an additional 100,000 compounds, we found that disulfiram remains to be the most effective molecule in inhibiting this. We can show the IC50 is around submicromole, and the small molecule can bind um, to gastrimine D using this uh, MST assay, microscale thermophoresis assay, also uh, in the micromolar range. So the story on disulfiram or antibus has been quite interesting. I read that this drug was initially, initially identified because was initially identified in Denmark because factors, factory workers there, uh, in, the, in factory workers from uh, a rubber plant, they couldn't drink after a day's work. It turned out this disulfiram, which is used in rubber processing, is important for this process. And some doctors in Denmark then um, developed this as a drug to deter drinking in, in, uh, in patients who suffer from alcoholism. And this drug was actually also approved by US FDA in the 1950s. So it has been about 70 years. And it has been very safe in uh, treating a chronic alcoholics patient. So in, in uh, vitro, we found that disulfiram as a uh, cysteine modifying drug covalently 
attached to one of the cysteine residues in gastrin D. And this residue not only is very reactive, but also very important for the membrane insertion. So these are the beta strands that's in the, uh, in the, within the beta barrel in the pore. It's very important for the insertion. And by modifying this residue, the gastrin D protein can no longer insert into the membrane. So we also tested whether, whether disulfiram can also inhibit other steps in inflammasome activation. Uh, it turned out their effects on any other steps are quite minimal. It didn't affect the assembly of the inflammasome as shown by the formation of these specs. It didn't affect the uh, processing of caspases or the processing of gastrin D, but it cannot allow the process gastrin D to insert uh, into the, uh, it's this one here, insert into the membrane to form pores. So suggesting even though this is a sulfur modifying compound, it is relatively selective against gastrin D. With Judy's lab, we further tested that disulfiram can suppress LPS-induced sepsis in mice. So interestingly, in another thread, uh, the group of Kate Fitzgerald just published uh, this work suggesting that the cysteine, the same cysteine residue that is modified by disulfiram, it is also modified by DMF, dimethylfumarate, which is, which is a known drug, which is also a known drug. And also it's the same cysteine that's modified by endogenous fumarate. So in this immunometabolism cycle, fumarate is accumulated during macrophage activation. And then this uh, fumarate uh, can succinate gastrin D to provide a feedback regulation on the inflammasome pathway, which is uh, really quite interesting how the compound that we identify in vitro is also uh, shares the mechanism that is used for regulation in cells. So when we, when we uh, identified disulfiram, we thought we should be able to look at uh, whether disulfiram usage is related to a suppression of other inflammatory diseases, if this effect is real. Uh, and, um, and then COVID come. So we, we were, because the severe COVID-19 disease is always associated with cytokine storm. And we have data in our Andrudy's lab showing that patient samples uh, either in the blood or in the lung have activated inflammasomes. We thought we should check whether disulfiram uh, has any effects on COVID-19. So we uh, stroke a collaboration with uh, the VA hospital and there they have very good record of patients. And finally, they were able to um, get permission, which took a long time uh, to look at the uh, to look at these uh, patients, about 500,000 of them, uh, and look at whether there's an association between those who take disulfiram versus those who do not take disulfiram. So their initial analysis showed, so we're, this work is still ongoing, their initial analysis showed that there is a fairly significant hazard ratio reduction in those patients who are treated with disulfiram. Uh, quite significant, uh, more so than some other traits such as blood type uh, association. So that was pretty exciting. So um, we are for sure interested in trying to repurpose disulfiram for sepsis and maybe other inflammatory diseases. Um, uh, other data out there also showing disulfiram may be, uh, may be uh, effective in attenuating uh, EAE in mice. And there is now two clinical trials going on on disulfiram and COVID-19. Uh, the trial at UCSF that's shown here 
is already starting and we are collaborating with them to look at patient samples. Another trial is also uh, starting in Brazil um, and may also be in the Indian tri India trial may also start soon. So I hope uh, with, uh, with this, uh, I've given you some example in how basic research may translate into improving human health as also what you're doing as well. So the work uh, has been conducted by talented postdoc and students in my lab uh, and with close collaboration with uh, Judy Lieberman's lab. And I thank you for your attention. <laughs>